actually I've worked at the Institute for Transport Studies for around 30, 30 years doing transport research um, and there are a group of us, so 40 or 50 of us up there and, and what we're finding out now is that transport research isn't being uh, undertaken by transport researchers anymore, it's being undertaken by people who come from the um, ICT community, it's been done by mathematicians, it's been done by technologists, all sorts, all sorts of people. So uh, for me it's an absolutely fantastic opportunity to, uh, to come down here and I'm just so pleased I've had this opportunity because Jack's been saying to me for around two years, uh, look, we've got this clean web thing going on, you need to come down and uh, it's always clashed with something, but this time there were no excuses and I'm, uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here. And if you do want to get in touch afterwards and talk about um, anything that I'm, I'm going to say tonight, please do so. <clears throat> so, um, just to say something about carbon and energy and transport, I probably don't even need to say that much because in one sense we're all experts in, in transport because we all use it every day. We all, we're all, we all know how much uh, carbon and um, energy it uses. So, the, the kinds of statistics that we always throw about 2008, that it's transport, uh, constitute about 30% of the CO2 emissions and from that around 60% of it comes from, from private vehicles. So we all know um, the storyline on this. So what's, what's it about then? Well, for us it's about um, reducing the burden, the carbon energy burden from the transport sector. But at the same time, and I did describe myself as a grounded statistician, not because I've done something naughty, but because uh, you know, we've, got our, we've got our heads screwed on with this. Um, that there are certain occasions when we must use transport, that's, that's a fact. I will hold my hands up and say I drive a car. And the reason why I drive a car is because I live out on the moors and uh, the, uh, the danger of sounding as if I'm um, you know, some, something that has come off the moors. I have actually come off the moors today. Um, so the way that we get about is, is by a car sometimes. But for many of us, there are, there are options to move out of that. And my research is about trying to nudge people into a behavioural change, which um, allows them to make choices, more sustainable choices about how, how they use the, the transport system. So I want to talk about some of that research today. But these are some of the places where ICTs come into transport. Uh, we've had them for about 30 odd years, which maybe some people will know. Uh, we've got traffic control rooms, which are linked to traffic lights, which can dynamically um, change lights to get traffic through. And uh, the, the less time that traffic is sat idling, the fewer emissions it's creating. We're linked up to uh, smart motorways, and I've been quite a bit of smart motorway work as well. Uh, which is about um, oversaturated systems and managing to get large volumes of uh, traffic through uh, the system, trying to calm speeds because that also reduces emissions for us. Um, it's also about connecting uh, now connecting vehicles to the rest of the infrastructure, so we're more aware about what individuals are, are doing, where they're moving. Um, but increasingly, this is the bit that I want to focus on really, uh, we're now using social media, the web, um, smartphone applications, etc. to allow us to actually reach real life travelling uh, public and to communicate with them and to, what we want to do is to incentivise them towards behavioural change. Behavioural um, change will mean uh, making some differences in terms of the choices uh, concerning how we travel, when we travel, uh, whether we choose to uh, share, whether we choose to travel at all. But just in case anybody's saying, well, can ICTs have an impact on the transport sector at Carbon Burn? This is a, this is a, a summary of some research that's, that's happened about different kinds of ICT-based schemes, and there are a lot of them around. Um, and there is a lot of variation in these statistics, but you can see we're potentially talking about getting up to 20% um, savings in terms of CO2 emissions, down to teleworking, which is less than, probably less than 5%. There's a lot of contentious figures here we could talk about, but incentivization, which is the, the thing that I'm interested in, around 5% and so on. So a lot of variation, but a lot of potential through different kinds of schemes. So it isn't whether ICTs can, can generate energy and carbon impacts, but how, what the size of these might be, so we argue a lot about this, how best to design ICT-based schemes, uh, which is a challenge for, for ourselves as transport researchers, and how to capture the impacts. In other words, if we say we're introducing um, an application which is going to nudge behaviour, how do we know that it has nudge behaviour? How do we know that people are making different choices? How do we know that we've actually saved any uh, carbon from introducing these schemes? Because there is a danger as well that we get a little bit overexcited and, and think, well, okay, if we've introduced this scheme, it must have had some kind of impact. 
Um, so Smarter Choices then, through social media and applications, through a smartphone, the, the Smarter Choices are to choose different boats, um, to choose to travel at different times, because by travelling at different times, um, we can uh, travel at times where the, uh, the system can better cope with the, uh, with, with the transport demand, which means that uh, we tend to generate fewer emissions from the, the travel that we do. We can share with each other, we can choose to stay at home, or we can adapt the journey which means that choosing to go on those routes if we are driving um, that um, are less crowded, less saturated, and that helps the system as well. And all that does uh, translate into carbon and energy benefits. So I want to tell you about two, two projects. The first is Sunset, which is a project that's, that's finished now. And we had um, a specific application that we developed, a TripZoom application. And um, this was a this was a, a story of um, growing and a journey that we went through um, to find out how we can do this nudging behaviour and, and what's needed and how easy or how difficult it was and we found it was difficult and maybe to you guys that's that that you would know all this that I'm going to tell you but I'll just I'll just play it all back to you. So we created um, an, an, a software application. We asked people to download this in, when we came to our living labs we had around 500 people in three cities across Europe who, who downloaded this with permission. They knew that their mobility was going to be tracked as, as part of this and we created different features on it. So we had um, friends, there's a lot of emphasis on friends and sharing um, places, so finding out the different places that people went to um, and how long they stayed there and then some mobility things that happened on in terms of uh, which modes people were choosing to go by, for what proportion of time. And there are even more um, interfaces that we have. We have maps <coughs> showing you where you've been, um, a carbon counter, a cost counter, all, all sorts of things. So what we ended up with was what I'm calling app identity crisis. We didn't really know what this app, what was the identity of this app that we created. You know, this is, this is why you'll maybe be able to relate to this, but I'll come back to you. Uh, on that one. But this is the kind of data that we were generating, and this is my data because I only show my own uh, data uh, uh, because I've not got permission to do it. And it's at quite a high level of resolution, this, but that's where I live actually there, up on near Harden Moor. And this is where I travel into Leeds. And this data has been all automatically generated through the application that was um, on, on my mobile phone. So we were triangulating bet between various signals that were coming through the GPS and um, uh, the, uh, the mask signal and um, other things that we were picking up and we created the, the mo mobility profiles and we could see which routes I was taking and how often I took those routes and we can actually track it point to point. So if I was to zoom in on this you would see the cul-de-sac where I live, you would see the hairdressers that I go to, uh, you would see that I go to the gym up near Addingham. You would see that I go for a walk on uh, harder in Harden, etc. And that might not seem very interesting to you, but actually, as transport researchers, this is hugely interesting to us because what we can then do is we, we can connect the places that people go to by habit with other kinds of activities. So that um, if we know that if um, I go to a particular supermarket, say I go to Sainsbury's a lot, and we could see my regular car parking slot. Um, that I would be interested in having Sainsbury's discount vouchers as an incentive, so that's something that would be of interest to me. It wouldn't be of interest to offer me something like um, uh, money, off, uh, money off children's nappies or something, because I don't have young children. So knowing what kinds of things um, incentivise people is really, is, is really quite important. And this level of detail not only told us about transport behaviour, it told to, to, it told us about social, economic characteristics as well. You can work out um, something about my income by knowing the location that I live in and the house prices there. So it all starts to become <coughs> actually very re revealing to us. And um, this is this is where I go to work there in Leeds. And we, we knew that it, it hit bang on target actually. That is my office with the X marks the, the place. It told me how how often I stayed there, Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays were big hit days and the distribution through the day. And if you imagine that this wasn't me doing this for myself, but was collecting this data on lots of uh, members of the public, then this actually became a very rich database for us. <coughs> 
Um, this is another application, Commute Green Run, some of you maybe know about this, this software application, but this is a similar kind of thing. Um, there is a lot of transport information on this, and uh, you can see some of the interfaces there. It's telling people all sorts of things, traffic updates, congratulations, points, um, things about journeys, all, all sorts of things going on. But when we look at this, it's actually a very, very busy set of interfaces. And whilst we were all um, reveling, in how much data we could collect and how, uh, how much stuff we could get on the interface with the, with the application, um, we, we started to come to some realisations. We took feedback from members of the public who, who we worked with um, and we realised that there was this sort of triangle going on. Um, there were the things that we thought, that's usually transport research as we all look like that on, on the Monday morning. Um, so the, there were things that we wanted, which was this very rich data, which was telling us all sorts of really useful information, allowing us to design um, positive incentives and relevant incentives to people. There were the ICT experts, and this is how I imagine you all you all look, if you can relate to this or not. Uh, and then the members of, members of the public and the feedback we were getting from them. And this is, this is some of the list of the things that people wanted out of this application in various, in various different ways. So personal control was really important to the, to the public, whereas the social aspect, the, um, the foolproof part and the performance was very important to the ICT people we were working with. Whereas as transport researchers, we wanted it to be very accurate and, and detailed. The public wanted it to be 100% faultless and 24-7 uh, support, which we couldn't give, give to them, of course. So we realised that in trying to use um, software in this way, that we were opening up a lot of issues that we weren't uh, managing to fulfil in lots of ways. So that was a that was sunset. Um, we did find out that people were willing to amend their behaviour in response to uh, challenges, points, gains and so on, that they were willing to shift outside the peak time and um, willing to uh, also not, not to take journeys as, as a part of the as a part of the uh, uh, experiment as well. So what comes now? Well What's happening next is the follow-on project. Believe it or not, having learned all that, we, have, we haven't been dissuaded. We're going to, we're going to move on. So Empower um, is our next project. This is a H2020 funded one, so it's one of the very early ones that have come through. Our goal for Empower is a 15% reduction in conventional fueled vehicles in the use of conventional fueled vehicles as measured in vehicle kilometers. So it's going to be really important to us, again, that we track people's behaviors that we know how many vehicle kilometres that they're travelling by um, car, so that we can evaluate whether the things that we put out to them um, are going to change their behaviour or not. What we're going to do this time is we're going to we're not <laughs> going to start off with a brand new app. We're going to do brownfield apps and use recycled software. Uh, so it's, it's something green going yeah, on there as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we put so much resource into pulling together a new app, I don't know why. Yeah. Um, but we're, yeah, we're going to recycle this time, and I think that, that is the way forward, definitely. So there won't be one Empower's uh, piece of software, there will be several. We're going to provide, we're going to look at positive incentives, and we're going to do some big data mining to be able to uh, segment the population and to learn more about what switches on different kinds of people. So this is where the big data centre of the leads that I'm involved in, that's, that's going to support us in terms of being able to do that. Um, we will do mobility profiling again with, with permission and we've, now we've, we've managed to refine our algorithms so that we're, some of the detail that we want uh, and the accuracy we'll be able to uh, will be able to be fulfilled um, in, in this next project. But we're also going to get into social innovation, as I'm calling, which is about sharing. Um, we've talked a little bit about, about this before the meeting, actually. It's got, about getting people together in, in a social way, uh, getting them to share, uh, share rides, definitely, but to share information and knowledge. Um, so, for example, people who know information about uh, what's happening out on the system to be able to contribute it to the community so that we know to avoid particular routes or people who know about uh, great cheap off-peak deals can share it with their neighbours 
and also they can share in terms of taking trips out of the system. So if somebody's got a parcel down at the post office, get people to share as a community, pick up parcels together. Um, so we've got, we're going to use some existing communities with that as well, because again, I think starting up a new community um, is, not something, is not something we want to do. Um, we're going to do four living labs that we've already planned. We're going to run a competition across Europe for seven take-up cities once we've got the, the first bit of experimentation out of the way. And we're going to ask people to come forward. We've got some funds and cities who want to be part of Empower will be, um, be able to do that. We're asking that they bring something to, to the table if they can, which is maybe a scheme, a scheme that they're planning to do, some data that they're planning to do, um, their own application or whatever. So the final slide. Um, our empowered challenges were very much like the goldfish uh, jumping out of the small bowl when actually we barely managed to swim in that, but getting into the big one already. The design of the schemes will be absolutely critical. Uh, can we, have we made an impact against the KPIs? Because have we managed to get that 15% reduction is a big question because the people who are paying for this will want to know if it's the commission. Um, upscaling is a big issue for us. Um, and how to do this because we are talking about 500 people who are probably looking to get a million people or more um, doing this across Europe and recruitment and retention of people is a big issue so if people have got insights on, into, the, into these kinds of issues then do email me and uh, let me know how to do it. <coughs> contributions very welcome, that's it.